fans of today. How's everybody doing on this Monday night? Been a crazy, crazy weekend, but had a lot of fun. So we're back at it tonight. And tonight I've got a guy joining me and I'm going to tell you what they say about him. He's genuine. He's versatile. He's passionate. He's persistent. And those are just four words to describe this young man. And uh, some folks has even, have even said, if you take Sam Hunt and Johnny Cash and they had a music baby godfathered by Eminem, you would get this guy, plus the fact that uh, he can rock a pretty pretty cool mullet, too. So let's go ahead and bring him on. It's Ryan Trotty. Ryan, how are you, my man? Man, I'm great. How are you guys doing? Uh, we are doing awesome. So i um, glad to have you on and excited about tonight to find out more about Ryan Trotty. Man, I appreciate it. I'm um, excited to be with you guys. I appreciate y'all having me. Hey, we're, we're grateful to have you here. I mean, I, I went down through some of your accolades today, and I don't even have enough time in the show to read all these things, but you have <laughs> been like the Carolina Country Music Awards Entertainer of the Year. You've been on the Carolina Country Music Fest stage with so many people. You've worked with some great folks, and you have just done so much that, like I said, I don't have enough time on the show to talk to you and to read all that stuff to everybody. So we're just going to have to go over it as we go along. How about that? That works for me, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. So I'll Ryan has put out. To... <laughs> What's that? I, I said, I'll be here as long as you want to be. <laughs> All right. Well, you, you just released your radio single debut. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. We're going to bring folks up to date on that so they can kind of hear that. Um, and it's, I mean, it's done amazing so far. 2022 has started off to be an awesome year for you, but let's go back a while to growing up and tell us how music became to be such a big part of your life. It, you know, it's probably a very similar story to a lot of musicians. It's just, you know, I feel like I've been around music as far back as I can remember. My mom's family all played and, and sang and did music. And I just remember family reunions. We'd be all together and, it, and just several people would have guitars and there was pianos and it was just common for me to be around music. And my dad, he had a, he was a drummer and uh, he had, a, he had a full Ludwig set uh, of drums set up in our, um, in our, the first room you walk in, in, in our home, it was kind of an older, uh, Southern kind of Victorian style home. And, and it, the first room you walked into right off the porch was like a formal dining room. And it was anything but that it was, it was a music room and it had, had a full drum set and it had a big tall stereo system back when, you know, they had those. And, uh, right. man, like I said, just been around music moving my whole life in one form or fashion. So mom actually kind of got you into it at a young age by teaching you some little bit of keystrokes on the piano or to some blues stuff. Yeah. You know, it, it kind of goes back to the whole family reunion, you know, being around music. I just, I kind of was, mm -hmm. I was, I was jealous cause I couldn't be involved. I was too young. Really. I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I, I think it was like third grade or something like that. I had her show me a little, you know, a little blues riff or whatever. And, uh, it it kind of just took off from there. I just became addicted to, you know, to the piano was my first instrument I learned. And then guitar came after that. And and that's kind of what set the spark. But I just wanted to find a way to be involved because it looked like it was so much fun. And I was just standing there, you know, like a kid. <laughs> right. Right. And I mean, when the family's involved, like you said, you're just kind of standing around. You feel kind of left out and and kids don't I like to be left out. No, I wanted to be, I wanted to have a tambourine or a microphone or, or something I could be, you know, be active and involved with them. So, it, cause it looked like it was so much fun. And well, I, I guess it was because I enjoy doing it now. So <laughs> I guess it was fun for them right. as well. So you kind of started out as a musician and then, and, and I, I might be jumping <laughs> ahead because there's another part I want to refer back to, but when did you find your voice, so to speak, to start singing? That's actually a really good question. I was, uh, I was never really a vocalist. I was never really um, a singer. I don't think that was something that I was uh, naturally um, good at. I, I think my skill set was more involved with writing and playing, and um, I was producing and putting together a lot of music at a young age and kind of composing. So I thought that was kind of where my strength was. And when I was younger, I wasn't – as as confident and comfortable as I am now on stage I had a little bit of stage fright and I didn't really like being put on the spot I loved people knowing that I did music and I liked to let them hear my music but as far as performing it it wasn't something that 
um, I initially was just drawn to. So that came last. That came almost mm -hmm. out of necessity because I knew that if I was going to get out on the road and make a full time living doing music, then I just had to, I just had to bite the bullet and do it. And so I threw brute force <laughs> kind of came out and, uh, and thankfully it did because now it's one of my most favorite things to do. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. But I mean, you, you learned, um, you learned musicianship. Like you said, you started off piano, you went to guitar, of course you got on the drums possibly when dad wasn't around. So he didn't yell at oh, you yeah. or anything. <laughs> Like Absolutely. Well, my, my mom played them too. So, you know, when she was oh. home watching the kids, you know, she was a multi, she was pretty good at a lot of things. She wasn't, she wasn't a, you know, a master at any, but she was good enough at enough that uh, she got me, you know, my, my, my hands were in a couple of different cookie jars there. Right. And Long then you talked cookie. about, you talked about how, when you got older, you started producing. Now that's interesting because you were about 12 <laughs> when you started producing music. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it was, I was, I kind of came up in, in the whole hip hop, you know, all, uh -huh. all rock in hip hop era, and um, I was just fascinated with the fact that you could get a keyboard or a music workstation and have all of these um, sounds and have all of these uh, sequencing ability. You know, this was this was far, this was way before that was like a common thing. This was, this wasn't in every you know, everyone didn't have a bedroom production studio at the time. That was, right. that. I found myself hanging out a lot at the music store as a kid, really aggravating all the, the workers there, asking them questions and playing on the instruments. But that came from my love of, um, you know, hip hop and pop. I wasn't really producing real instruments. I was just playing piano and laying down drums and beats and stuff. And later right. as I got older and learned how to play guitar and, and, and had more knowledge around music in general is when I started producing, you know, more country and rock type stuff. Right. But that was kind of the development stage, the developmental stage right. of your ear, because you can't be a good producer if you don't have a good ear. I mean, you got to be able to tell and direct and kind of, help folks with what they're doing when you're a producer. For sure. I mean, and even now um, when I'm in the studio and I've, you know, I've got a new song I've written that I'm, you know, tracking, being able to understand the, the lingo and, and the, the process and what does what and how different things work together. It, it allows me to be able to co-produce and, and really help the direction of the song versus just sitting back and letting someone else, you know, kind of control the whole thing. And right. I love being involved in the creative process from start to finish, from writing the song to recording and producing and, you know, all the way up to performing it. So it, I'm glad I've got that foundation from when I was younger, because it's definitely helped me now. Well, let's talk about the songwriting for a minute then, because I mean, do, do you remember the first song you ever wrote? <laughs> um i i don't remember exactly the first very first one but i remember the first couple like i don't know exactly what was what was first or you know second but i remember right. the early stages when i was writing and they were terrible my mom <laughs> loves them of course but they were the they were the songs that only a mother could love i think <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what genre were you chasing at that time I, I don't think I was old enough to really even know. I, like I said, I, I never really had, when I started doing music, I was doing it because I liked music. I liked, I grew up in a right. household of, uh, my mom was big on classic and traditional country. My dad was a big classic rock, you know, Beatles, Skinner, you know, Eric Clapton. He was a big rock guy. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of, like I said, I kind of came up when hip hop was really becoming more popular and I was really, I mean, I hate to sound cliche, but I was really influenced by all of those things. And then, of course, when we would get together for family get togethers, it was a lot of uh, gospel music and, and hymns. And my mom and dad both played um, music in the church and my grandmother and so forth. So I really I really didn't have a direction. I just played and wrote whatever hit me at the moment, and whatever I thought sounded cool. You know, that was that right. was pretty much that involved pop country, everything. Well, who are some of the writers that you kind of looked up to or, or even now still look up to as far as writing music? Who are some of the ones that you kind of um, can consider to be your inspiration, so to speak? It, it's hard to leave. Uh, it's hard to not not say Dean Dillon. I mean, he's he's just been a part of so many classic country songs and his story. I, I watched his, the documentary recently and 
what just what an amazing story and and what an amazing uh journey you know for him and and he he just he's probably one of the first people that come to mind but i mean gosh to try to to try to put some of your favorite ones in a bucket there's just so many good ones from multi genres it's hard to really it's hard to really wrangle them in absolutely absolutely and especially he's when like definitely, he's definitely one of the top ones yeah, Dean is is one of the best writers, you know, and then today, I mean, I, some of the ones that I know of today, if you're just talking like um, country music, you've got Shane McAnally, you've got, um, um, oh, is it uh, Casey Bethard? Is he another, is he, he's, I know he wrote um, or still writes. And then, uh, I mean, just so many great ones that are out there. It's hard to put a finger on one or two. Yeah, it really is. And, um, you know, today you've got more artists who are writing their own music as well. So I'm 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 really partial artists who write their own music because that's that's me. You know, so I can speak kind of directly uh, from that from that position. Uh, but there's just something about the way a song comes a- across when an artist has written it and then they're performing it. You know that you're hearing it in exactly how it was intended to be heard. Um, not that other artists aren't able to do that, but I don't know. There's just something special about an artist that write their, you know, that writes their own song. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of Morgan Wallen, Luke Combs. Mm-hmm. Those are, you know, of course, some of the more modern, more modern guys. Um, Ernest, obviously, Hardy, all those guys are just super talented writers as well as performers. So um, I've never, I've never, you didn't ask this, but this kind of, kind of segues into this. I've never really understood the whole modern versus traditional rift in country. Like, I don't know why people can't just like and appreciate both. Um, everybody I know that, that plays new country, all love nineties country as well. And vice versa. You know, there's, so I don't, I don't understand sometimes how they, um, you know, that rift is, is so, so popular. Cause I just, yeah. I like it all. <laughs> and that's right now. Yeah. I mean, I'm the same way. I mean, I, I love nineties country and even going back, you know, to, uh, uh, to before that and, and, you know, Johnny cash, Merle Haggard, um, you know, even, I, I mean, I'll throw on a John Anderson on occasion, you know, <laughs> his mean, voice is so unique. I mean, as soon as you hear it, you know, it's John Anderson. Yeah, is that uh, Tracy Lawrence? Tracy's the same way, and uh, and Tracy, you know him as soon as he opens his mouth and hits yep. that first note, you pretty much know it's Tracy. <laughs> you Lawrence. know exactly who's singing, right? And there's a lot of those guys. I mean, and those were, I mean, you know, they were '90s, and and some of them were back into the the '80s, you know, mid to late '80s and stuff as well. But mm-hmm. the uh, the thing, I mean, I I guess the one thing about country music, like to kind of go along with what you were saying it's uh, country music has always been about what you know has always been about people you know right. it's always about the people listening to it and you have to go where they're at in order to get some of that stuff mm-hmm. um you know, i'm i'm not a i i gotta be honest the only thing i'm not a fan of with a lot of the modern stuff is and and they may not do it as much as i think they do but they tend to make it sound like it is using too much of the the sequencing on a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, programming drums and such. Yeah, yeah, programming the drums and stuff. I'm a, a drummer from old school. I mean, I've got an electronic hit behind me, but that's all I can fit in the studio. You're right. So, <laughs> that's my you know, necessity. <laughs> Um, but I'm, I'm more a, you know, I like that acoustic drum sound, that big, you know. It's uh, not, I don't, I mean, it's hard to compete with it. You, you can't, oh, yeah. it, it's hard to really replace that, that acoustic sound mm-hmm. and, and, and feeling that you get from, from hearing the snare and the, and the kick and all that. It's just, there's, I mean, the technology has certainly come a long ways. And, and, and a lot yeah. of times when we're writing or putting together a demo, you can, you can program some, some acoustic drums that sound pretty real, but there's mm-hmm. just still nothing like being in the studio with the drum, the session drummer and going over, you know, feels and kind of, that's another thing. When I'm in there, you know, with the drummer, I'm like, <laughs> he'll see me do a feel and he'll know when it's coming. And so I just, I don't know. It's hard for me to not be hands on on almost every part of the song process. Right. And a lot of it, I mean, you know, the se- necessity kind of dictates that, you know, like say if you're doing a demo, you don't, you don't have a lot of time to get in the studio and you don't, 
you know, to to lay down a full song like you want to. It's a demo. It's called that for a reason. So it makes sure. it a little yeah. easier. Um, but once you get in the studio, you know, give me if you got to tweak it here and there and maybe add a little bit. You know, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a producer. I'm not going to pretend like I am. But I know, you know, if you got to add a little bit of, you know, maybe a little more reverb on the snare to give a little bit longer yeah. lasting ring or something, then fine. But uh, I mean, I'm just a I just like the true music. You know, it would be like um I'm trying to think there. I I know I've seen these before, but, and it may have just been like in the, the eighties and the nineties where they had guitars that were fully electronic. They didn't even have strings on them and you can just like strum in the, like across a bridge or something and it would pick it up and, you know, and it was just like, I didn't like that. That's kind of odd, right? Yeah. I'll tell you one thing that, that has helped, I think in terms of just the final sound and the final like mix is, um, you know, being able to, to tr do sound replacement after you've uh, tracked a, you know, a real drummer. Um, one of the things that we, I mean, I think this is a pretty common practice, but um, one of the things that we do, obviously we'll have a session drummer come in and we'll mic everything up the way we want it to sound. And we'll get the room sounding, you know, pretty close to what we want it to sound like. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you just can't, get that beefy kick that you want or that that right. certain pop in the snare um, if you want a dead snare and such so it's really nice that they've got it now where you can still have the feel and the the groove of a live drummer with all the pushes and pulls and the small right. you know inconsistencies while being able to get that big sound that you want from the kick or from the snare and still keep that that acoustic um you know real vibe i, th I think that's just so cool you know, some stuff you couldn't do 15, 20 years ago without yeah. a lot of, a lot of pain and, and sweat and tears. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, who are some of the artists that, in, that have influenced you as far as your, your performance and your singing and that kind of thing? I mean, who are, who are some of the artists that you enjoy listening to? Maybe that's the best way to, to phrase that. Gosh, I, you know, like I said, I like Morgan Wallen. I like Luke Combs. I like Eric Church. Um, I'm a huge fan of Brooks and Dunn. Like I said, I love mm -hmm. older country. Um, I'm, I was a big, you know, George Strait fan. And, you know, again, not to be cliche, I kind of I probably fall right in line with almost what everyone else thinks. But I mean, there's a reason those guys are, you know, great, you know, and popular is because they're, you know, they're good. But uh, but then again, I'll you know, it doesn't have to be a commercial. I, I, one thing I love about technology in today's landscape, as far as music consumption and production and distribution is that you've got access to so much undiscovered talent on TikTok and, and YouTube, of course, and, and Instagram and such. Um, you know, a good song is a good song. I, I'll never forget. Um, and, to, and for me, it's all about the song. Um, you know, you could have somebody sing who's got the most beautiful voice in the world. And if the song isn't there, then, you know, it's just not going to keep my attention. And uh, I think it was Loretta Lynn on 60 minutes was a interview. And she basically said, you could take an average singer with a great song and turn them into a star. And, you know, whereas you might not be able to do that with a, with a beautiful, you know, great singer and an, and an average song. So right. it all goes back to the song. And, um, right. Thankfully, we've got access to so many great singers and songwriters and, and music with today's technology. It's just it's a good time to be. It's a good time to be alive. <laughs> so yeah. oh, my playlist, is. my playlist has no rhyme or reason. Let me just put it that way. If you looked at my Spotify, it would make no sense. It's like, well, I, he just likes music. <laughs> Well, let's let's use that as a segue into a question. If I opened up your playlist, who who are going to be the top ten people that you've listened to of, recently say, in the last week or so? Uh, you're gonna see, you're gonna see Ernest. You're gonna see uh, Dua Lipa, which is a pop artist. You're gonna see um, Shine Down, Love Rock. You're gonna see some you know some couple of the new Morgan Wallen songs. You're gonna see uh, let's see who's somebody I've really been. Oh, I love Co Wetzel. I've been listening mm -hmm. to Co Wetzel a lot lately, um, and uh, let's see who who else is who's kind of one of my go to. I've been listening to a lot of Parker McCollum, um, and I've always I've always got some uh, Brooks and Dunn in the in the top rotation. I just can't seem to. Then no matter how many times you've heard Neon Moon or you know some of the classics, just never die. You know, 
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Neon Moon or even Boot Scoot and Boogie, as much as that song's been worn out, you know. Yeah, I love the Man, song. We, but, you know, it's funny, it's funny how um what you listen to in the car or you know, when you're you know, when you're working out at the gym versus what appeals to you at a live show. Two right. totally different things a lot of times. Um like dust on a bottle, I would never turn that song on in my playlist to listen to it because it's just been played a million times. Right. But it doesn't matter how many times you've heard it. When you hear it come on live at a at a show or when you play it, the crowd loves it. It's always fun. Yeah. It just some songs are just made for the stage, you know? Right. Right. That's the the one that I have to point out. And and I love Garth Brooks. I love everything Garth does. But when it comes to friends in low places, you go into any bar, any anything in America where they're playing music and you're going to hear that song. Absolutely. But you go to a, a show and somebody starts singing that song and you've got the entire place singing along to it. It's amazing. I've I've personally you know my band and i have done that song uh, probably almost every show i mean there's not many shows that we haven't at some point done that show uh, that song mm -hmm. and each time i do it in the back of my mind i'm thinking these people are just going to think i'm the most cliche you know here we go again you know but never <laughs> fails the crowd just get they turn it up a notch i will say um one thing about being able to do it live and to kind of run my you know run my show and organize the show the way i want is the more shows that we have done and the more that we do there's i've learned how to work some of those overplayed songs in in a way that's still fun and creative it's where we don't just right. go we don't just start playing it not to give away all my my secrets like anybody would care what i think but if there's any other artists watching you know at some point um one cool thing that i started doing and this has made it really fun to to do that song but to have a reason to do it is we'll play wasted on you by morgan wallen which right. gonna start starts right out in that a arpeggio um and then it it kind of goes into that same chord progression but you would never think about those two songs being any even remotely close to one another stylistically or otherwise but right. start off almost you know very similar at least in the same tonality so i'll go I'll, we'll play wasted on you crowd will love it you know go crazy of course because they love morgan and then i'll say something like you know funny thing about music is that song and i'll i'll kind of set it up and say you know you would never guess that that song sounds like this next one but here you go and then you all it takes is those first three notes and everyone mm -hmm. knows the friends in low places and then they go crazy and then they're like, Oh my God, it really does kind of sound like, you know, the way it starts off. So I'm always looking for really creative little ways to work in classic songs. And, and a lot of times what I've found works the best is to pair them up with the, the more modern new stuff. Mm -hmm. You mentioned boot scoot and boogie. We'll play loving on you by uh, Luke Combs, mm -hmm. which is out of E and has that very, it has a similar tempo and same key. And we'll just go right into Boot Scoot and Boogie, transition right into it, and it takes them a minute, and then they realize what you're playing, and then they it kind of builds up, and then they you know goes crazy. So that's right. what I try to do as a showrunner. See, the thing I love about that is I've I've done like mobile DJing for a long time. I I work in radio during the day, but I've done weddings and and proms and reunions and all that stuff. And quite honestly, I'm sitting here taking notes because I'm going to go back and listen to these and go, you know what? My next show, I'm going to try that. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, I'm you got to it. It works. It uh, and it's not something I sat around and really thought about. It just it kind of. I don't, you know, somewhere along the way, we, you know, played those two songs in concession concession and, and or succession. And I said, well, you know what? That sounds, that does kind of sound like the way it starts off. And, right. you know, I'm, I'm constantly, I, that's another thing is, is very rarely do I ever run off of a set list at my shows. I'm almost always going off of, you know, what's in my head and, and what the room, what I feel like the room is, is uh, given, you know, the energy they're giving back. You know, if I had to go off of a set list or be stuck to a set list, I would probably go crazy because I can't count the number of times where I had written out a set list and I thought 
yeah, this neck, this ballot is going to be perfect in this spot. And then lo and behold, you get there and you're like, I do not want to play this slow song. We got to play another fast one. <laughs> so um, it got to the point where, you know, and it was funny because when my band, when we first got together, of course, I was, you know, su- you know, putting together a set list and they were all, you know, satisfied and they because they could see what was coming up. But then right. it, sh- slowly but surely each show, I started deviating more and more and more until the point where it literally got to where I wasn't even using my phone, an iPad, paper, anything. I was just going off of memory. And a lot of times I would just go into the song because I would be thinking about what am I going to play next while the other one's ending? Almost like a DJ, like a DJ would. Right. And right. uh and my band, boy, they got so they were so mad. They were like, it just took them forever to get used to that style of running the show. But now they're happy they did it because they're so in tune with what what's coming up. They hear it and they know exactly what the song's gonna be. Right. So and from a musician's so, point so of view. My band, I want to give them a shout out for that because they've really been they've really been awesome with this uh, on this journey. <laughs> And that's one of the things as, you know, when you're doing that and you're, you're in a live show, I, I it, it kind of lends to spontaneity. I mean, set lists are great. Right. Don't get me wrong. And, and they have, you know, they have their uses because there's some people, you know, like we went to a show Saturday night and, and it was a, a big artist. It was Kenny Chesney. I don't care to see who it is. And mm-hmm. after they got everything done, you know, you see one of the guys on the crew come out and they tape a set list down on the stage, you know, and and you're thinking he's got enough hits he doesn't have to to look at that he can just, you know? he can just play whatever right yeah yeah he's got so many songs that you know and his typical show is an hour to an hour and a half yeah and so but he's got probably five hours worth of music that he could play and never sing yeah, the same song twice absolutely you know? But that that spontaneity that comes out of that of just going, well, guys, we're gonna, you know, you kind of throw a curveball sometimes. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna throw you a curveball. I'm gonna hit these chords and I'm gonna see if the band can <laughs> can hang out. You know, that's what you're thinking. Yeah, and, exactly. And yeah. The band either likes it or they're cursing you something fierce in their minds. <laughs> right, right. We're gonna have, they're gonna have a talk after the show. It, it <laughs> took it took some growing pains with those guys because they had all come from from bands who were a little bit more structured in that, in that regard. And, um, and I, I'm not knocking, I'm not knocking. That's a, you know, tried and true, uh, way of doing things. And there's uh-huh. obviously pros and cons to, to doing that and to be able to have a tight show that you don't have to think about and you know, what's coming and you can make the transitions fl- uh, flawlessly and seamlessly. Um, you know, and, and almost make it look organic, but yet, you know what the show is going to be. I think there's a huge benefit to that clearly. Um, but again, you know, like you said, there goes, you go back to that, that creativity, that spontaneity, being able to, to read a room and feel the energy and read the energy. I learned now after doing this for, you know, a few, for a number of years, that that, that is its own skill set. you know, cause I've been to shows before, and and I'm these are bands that I'm a fan of, and I've been to the show. Right. And the show, the flow of the show, just wasn't, yeah, you know, well, it was fun, but it wasn't like, man, that was just, uh. right. So I think I think that that's something that I probably enjoy the most out of my live shows is just being able to to be able to just play what I feel like playing at that moment. Right. But well, and and let me ask you this, you know, because this is a question that I do like to ask. But uh, you know, we're hanging out at a party, and I'm DJing, and then I, I look over at you, and I'm like, "Hey, Ryan, come here," and I let you take over. What's the first song you're going to throw out there for people? Well, I mean, is this a is this a like a house party, a wedding? Is this a dance party? Is this, is uh, this let's a say a reunion, like a twenty year high school reunion? Oh man, I'm I'm probably gonna play some DMX. <laughs> that's my yeah. That's gonna get that's gonna get the uh, yeah, at least the, the old high school reunion people I know. That's gonna get them off their off their seats for sure. Right. Any 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 nineties hip hop party hip hop is gonna probably gonna be my go to. House of Pain, jump around like. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's certain songs that you hear come on and you just can't deny like what i mean you're just gonna obviously be dancing or moving around to right but 
if it's a country song, if it's like a country song and it's one that I just need, it's my go-to kind of like, you know, people are going to really rock with it. It's probably up down by Morgan Waller and, and with yeah. featuring Florida George line. So, or loving yeah. on you by Luke Combs. Those are two of my go-tos that seem to be very big cl- uh, crowd pleasers. Yeah. So, yeah. So, in, in your sets, what's the one song that's not yours, like the cover? What's the 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 one cover song that you have to have in every show that you just love to do? Well, there's probably there's probably two. There's probably two okay. that I would say. Well, now three. There's there's three. I'm gonna give you three. I'm gonna give you okay. three options here. Um, loving on you almost all the time starts off our if we if we don't play straight through which a lot of times we'll just play three or four hour shows straight through um in 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 the event that there's a it's multiple sets and we take them you know break or whatever almost in inevitably every second set we come out the gate and we lead off with loving on you it just Mm -hmm. i'm i'm a big fan of coming out the gate full throttle just right. smack them in the face. I'll never lead off with a ballad or anything. So that's definitely one that I, I don't think I could, I would feel like I did a good job if I left the show without having played it at least, at least right. one, that one, one time. The, um, the other one, which is, uh, we've been doing it for a number of years is cover me up. We were doing Jason Isbell's version for okay. you know, two, two, three years before, uh, Morgan Wallen came out and made it, uh, made it his, his, um, his big hit. So, right. We uh we definitely have been doing that one for a long time. We do a full band version, which is a little little more full and robust than than what you would hear on the record. But um, mm-hmm. that one just it doesn't matter if it's a room full of girls or if it's a bunch of couples or if it's an older crowd or young, it doesn't matter who's in the room or what venue it is. That song just goes over well, and um, I really like the way it fits my voice and my tone. It's I have a really kind of a raspy, kind of a smoothish but raspy tone, I think. And that, that song right. just fits the quality of my voice good. And the newest one that I like, that I love doing, is uh, Sturgill Simpson, You Can Have the Crown. Oh, yeah. And it's, and it's just got such an old honky-tonk, upbeat. Yep. You know, I just, man, I just love that song. That's, yeah, one, of my, that's one of my go-tos lately. <laughs> Those are all great songs. I mean, I, I love that. Now you, when you're, I mean, when you're up on the stage, has there ever been one of those moments? I mean, we're, we're going to get off music for just a second here, but, um, ha- have you ever had one of those moments that were like, um, a, just an embarrassing stage moment, I guess is the only way to say it. So what would you say is your most embarrassing stage moment? Cause I mean, you do a lot. It sounds like you do a lot of high energy stuff. So you kind of set yourself up for a lot of those moments. I'm just saying. I was just thinking, um, my biggest fear is, is falling, which I've been able to steer clear of thus far. Let's Uh keep it that way. Um, Whether that be, whether that be on stage or God forbid off the stage in you know, in Luke Bryan form, but, uh, (laughs) I, I that's my biggest fear honestly i i i it hasn't happened but uh let's just pray it doesn't happen but i don't know i think um i don't know i don't really get embarrassed by a lot like when i'm on stage it's my stage i you know i've stopped songs i've started them over and i make mm-hmm. it part of the show you know if if yeah. if if it's a new song and and, and everyone's not in sync or something gets off or i'll just tell the man to stop let's you know and I'm, i'll laugh it off and play and we'll do it again so not a lot really embarrassed i think that would probably be the most embarrassing thing was be would be a physical you know me tripping or falling or something but other than that i mean unless i split my pants or something i can't can't think of much that would embarrass me i mean i think the most I, there was one time where my string broke like right it right after this like beginning of the set like it was right out of the gate it wasn't like further in when you can kind of hey we're you know just keep rolling it kind of happened early and i put this you know i'm having to put on a new string kind of real quick and then my battery died 
So it, it was kind of an avalanche of things. It wasn't one particular thing that happened, but you know, when you're starting off, you don't always go over that mental checklist of, okay, new strings, new battery. New, and so it kind of, right. and of course it's not going to happen in, in sound check. It's going to happen right when the show starts, you know? Exactly. So that technical things that technical difficulties, I think would probably at this point be the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened. Right. Now, it, going back to your younger self and and looking back at when you started because i mean you you got into music like i said you were you were young what is a piece of advice that you would give yourself from say when you were 12 13 14 years old that you have found out since that is just valuable that you say okay if i could you know kind of like that letter to me type of thing yeah that's a great question i think I think I would have probably chosen to move to Nashville uh, at a, a, a early, sooner and, and, and began networking more in Nashville. Um, that That's probably the number one thing I would have changed about my journey is, mm-hmm. is getting there sooner and networking, you know, earlier. Um, that and having a little bit more of a, of a direction um being being a fan of music that i was and like i said i was very eclectic in my in my Mm -hmm. with my influences it it was good for certain things but i think in terms of having a direction and being laser focused on i'm going to be a country artist and i'm going to write my songs and this is what i'm going to do i think that probably held me back a little bit because I was doing hip hop. Right. I was writing this, I was producing that. And I was, you know, I was kind of all over the place for a while. And I was, you know, I didn't think about it because I was, I was younger and I didn't really know exactly what lane I wanted to be in. And, um, mm-hmm. I probably would have reeled that in a little sooner and just made the move to Nashville and, and put my roots down there and really tried to network and, and branch out, um, you know, at an earlier age. Right. Well, I tell you what, because we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, you and stuff and, and that's what this is all about. It's all about you. I want people to get to know you, but, uh, I've got some other stuff I want to talk about, but first thing I want to do is I want to give them a little taste of your newest single, uh, okay. that's called thanks for breaking my heart. And we're going to play that. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk to uh, Ryan Trotty some more and find out more about him. And we're going to get into a little fun stuff as well. Uh, got a couple of segments we're going to toss in there that uh, that we like to do. So we're going to do that. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, he's worried now, trust <laughs> me. <laughs> and uh, we'll do that coming back in uh, 30 seconds. Before Nashville is proudly sponsored by GoGo Tuners, the go-to tuner for professional and amateur musicians. Get your GoGo Tuner at gogotuners.com. Buy Heart to Heart Coffee, the coffee that gives back. Find out more at hearttoheartcoffee.com. Buy Sibby's Apparel, worn by heroes, made with respect. Order yours at sibbysapparel.com and buy Three Rangers Whiskey, not for the weak or faded hearted, threerangers.com. And started to read. I stopped smoking them cigarettes. Now I can breathe, and it's all because of you wanting to leave. I got a membership down at the gym. I started a new diet. Now I'm looking slim, and it's all because of you leaving with him. Thank you, girl, for breaking my heart. Thank you for the chance at a fresh start. Thank you for the need to wake up every day in the mode of Thank you, girl. Breaking my heart. I got my truck washed, shiny, clean. I bought a 
Brand new pair of Levi's jeans And you ought to see these boots on my feet I'm feeling better than I've ever been I got my life together, never settled in And it's all, all because I Y'all know why? Never took her back again. That's right. Thank you, girl, for breaking my heart. Thank you for the chance I had a fresh start. Thank you for the need to wake up every day and be motivated. Thank you, girl, for breaking my heart. It took losing you to find my way. The sun is shining bright and it's a brand new day. So if I ever see you again, I'd love to say. Thank you, girl, for breaking my heart. Thank you for the chance I had a fresh start. Thank you for the need to wake up every day and be motivated. Thank you, girl. Breaking my heart. All right, so that is uh, Ryan Trotty. Thank you, girl. whole thing so uh we're gonna come back on here hang on i gotta get my camera turned back on there i am so <laughs> trying to push buttons and talk at the same time i do that for a living you think i could do it tonight um give me the backstory on that song because it's it's kind of a i would classify it as a um kind of a kiss off <laughs> in a way <laughs> um yeah that song it was funny that uh it kind of it, it this upbeat and positive, obviously, but it came from a very, very real situation. You know, I was dating a really pretty girl. She was, um, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she was a cheerleader for the basketball team here, the NBA team. It was the Bobcats at the time. It's the Charlotte Hornets now. But um, at the time, it was the Bobcats, and she was a cheerleader. And um, it was just really cool to be dating an NBA cheerleader. I mean, that's there's no other way to put it. She, it wasn't right. the reason I was dating her, but it was just an added bonus. It was cool. And right. uh, other than that, I mean, I was really, you know, we had a really good time and we hung out. We all we had the same friends and it was, you know, it was really good while it was good. And um, it just it was kind of a complicated, you know, situation. You know, she had she had just gotten out of a long term relationship and, you know, there was baggage with that. And it just it just kind of fell apart. And it was just hard to take for a while. And, I, you know, that song is really in a lot of ways very true. I don't I don't smoke. I never smoke. But pretty much everything else that that song talks about you know eating better and going to the gym and you know getting more you know in touch with you know my my faith and whatnot those type of things really were <clears throat> you know kind of the things i turned to uh in that time of of you know being pa in pain and lost and such and uh in my mind, it was originally kind of like, I'm going to show, you know, I'm going to show her, I'm going to get in shape and I'm going to be this better person and I'm going to make her realize, you know, who, what she lost or you know, make her right. regret it. And as with all breakups, eventually time kind of heals all those wounds. You, you wake up one day and you, you don't feel those same hurt, you know, feelings, but you're in a better place because you use that as, as fuel to kind of get yourself to a better position. And, you wake up one day and you realize, man, that this was good for me. You know, I don't even care what that person thinks or what they're doing or if they even notice it or not. I'm in a better place for me. And, um, 
yeah, I just it felt like I said, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to, rather than being resentful and having this animosity, I wanted to be thankful. And that was my way of expressing it. So, and, and now it's one of my favorite songs to play. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a great song. It's I, a fun, I, upbeat, melodic yeah. song. Yeah, I'm just be bopping away. I'm just having a good time with it. And so, you know, and and a friend of mine, he's he's like, I love the steel fields and the runs and you know and and that guy and that's me. I like the steel guitar and I love sounds, that steel. Yeah. Oh man, it sounds so good in the guitar <laughs> or, and the song and stuff. And uh so let's get to a couple of the features real quick. Cause these these are a couple of things that that uh I kind of like to do, and, and I'm hoping I'm going to push the right button when I do this, because it's been a while since I've done this one, so we'll find out, all right? So this is a part of the show where I delve into something about you that some people may not know or something like that. And, and, and I've got something out of your bio and it's not like it's, you know, going to be a detriment to national security to tell this, <laughs> but um, you have worked with one of my favorite rock bands. Okay. And the song that I love by these guys is called cold and it's the band crossfade and you've been able to work with them. Yeah, so um, I grew up in a little town uh, below Columbia, South Carolina, about an hour, maybe 45 minutes to an hour south of Columbia. It's called Springfield. And um, one of one of the biggest bands in Columbia um, before they made it was, was Crossfade, but they weren't called Crossfade. They were called uh, The Nothing. And then they changed from The Nothing to Sugar Daddy Superstar. And then um, they kind of got discovered on an old music A&R online um, distribution thing called Taxi. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. Taxi. Um, but next thing you know, they just exploded and, and blew up. Well, I was friends with the lead singer, Ed Sloan, for years and years and years before they became a national you know, band. They were just a local they, we were all friends with a lot of the same people and right. um, we would go to their shows and hang out afterwards and stuff. So I had a, I had a personal friendship with, with Ed before they ever became really big and successful. And so, you know, once that took place, um, I was able to kind of get in the studio and, and do some you know, writing and some recording and stuff. Um, I, I certainly, I, I wasn't involved with any of their commercial success, but it was still cool to get in there and work with them on a creative level after they had already had that success because they're huge they were huge at the time and right. it was just really neat for someone like me who at the time i was still kind of cutting my teeth and learning my way and kind of finding you know my voice so to speak and uh to have that to have that experience to just be able to get in there with such a with that kind of gravitas it was it really helped me later on in my music journey to, mm -hmm. to be able to feel confident that I was, you know, fit for, you know, to be where I was going to be, you know, it, it gave right. me the confidence to, to pursue my own journey. Right. And so. I mean, that's, that's just because I have, I mean, I've, I've admired those guys for years. I mean, unbelievable I, band, unbelievable no. band. Gosh, it was, I think uh, I was going through CDs the other day and found their CD. As a matter of fact, I'm like, golly, I got to, put that in my truck and listen to it. Cause I, I do have a CD player in the house, but it's not connected right now. <laughs> so. You know, I, I did not grow. I did not know a single celebrity growing up. Um, I don't know many now I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting a few, but I, I don't, I, I'm from a tiny, tiny town in rural South Carolina. I mean, I, we had like 600 people. That was our population. And, um, it, we were so small that they combined our town phone book with the next town over it was wasn't the springfield phone book it was the springfield sally phone book but um so so for me at that time having just even any any connection to anybody that was doing something even remotely kind of cool outside of you know having a business in town or whatever was just the right. neatest thing and um and they were so so huge so fast and then next thing i know i see him on the tonight show and the late show and it was just really cool uh 
yeah. for me, it was, it was definitely a kind of a, a milestone, you know, for me, it, it being it being young and kind of having that that company. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, before I get into the other segment, because this is a question I like to ask everybody, and I I, I have to ask at every show I do, uh, of just for the simple fact of I want to know. What is the one song as a songwriter that you sit back and you go, oh, man, why did I not write that song? I wish I'd wrote that song. Let's, I've said that about a few, um, <laughs> but let's, let's see. What is, what is the one? Man, that's a great question. It totally puts me on the spot. I've said it a few times about, friends in other places i'm like man well, i wish that was my song how, how many how many artists want that to be their song <laughs> exactly. but you know <laughs> that's a cop out i think that's just too too obvious um honestly i think one that makes people gasp every time they hear it sang is uh the dance i think if i could have oh. if i would have written the dance i think that would have been probably one of the coolest songs it's just such a beautiful song it's 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 just a timeless classic and oh, yeah. I still love doing that at my acoustic shows. Yeah. And, and it's so funny because you're, you're right. I mean, it's one of those songs that people are just like, Oh, wow. Every you know, time. And, I mean, as soon as you start singing it, looking back, I mean, people just, yeah. uh, they gasp every time they're like, Oh my yep. gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Whether they're at a Garth show or anybody else's show, it doesn't matter it, who's singing it, it. If they can do a decent job at it, they still love it. That that's um, exactly right. Yeah. What a great, what a beautiful song. And the, so, the whole story behind how he found it at Bluebird Cafe and just right. What a cool, <laughs> what a cool st story, man. Yeah. That, I was, I was that's definitely watching his uh, documentary the other day where he was talking about that. And I was just like, and I've seen that thing probably five times. I just, it's amazing. It is. Um, it absolutely is. So here's another um, little feature we're going to get into. And this one is, it's a little bit different um, because the questions are just really off the wall and they may not Bring make a lot of sense when I ask them. So uh, we'll, we'll, I'm going to start off with one uh, just here in a second. All right. Let's do it. What the hell? What the hell? What the hell? What the hell? I had to title it that because so many people just go, Really? You asked that question? <laughs> because they are off the wall. And uh that's what makes so hey, that's what makes this stuff fun. It would be boring if it was just <laughs> trivial. Exactly. I, I'm gonna start off with a couple of the really um as as somebody just put up, oh Lord ones here. Um when you use a public bathroom, what stall do you go into? The men's <laughs> that works. <laughs> uh, if you and see, I love that because that says to me that you're thinking a lot more outside the box than a lot of people. Because the guys typically go, you know, one, two, three, whatever, you know. <laughs> but you're thinking public bathroom. I don't specify when you're going in. A lot of times it's just room. one. It's just one. Right. You know, if it's at a gas yeah. station, you might you might have the whole stall to yourself. Right. <laughs> So, but I love that. That's great. Um, if you could take a bath in anything, what would it be? You said a bath. A bath. Yep. Um. <laughs> Hot water. <laughs> I, mean, I told you they have no rhyme or reason. This, this is God, just my. I, I, this is making mind. me sound not too creative at all. <laughs> See what I, can't I do think is of I anything think that would be more comfortable than just a nice hot bath, you know. The, not <laughs> I, the, certainly not jelly or Vaseline or you know whatever <laughs> else salt. I don't know what Chocolate is pudding, it. I had that answer. Chocolate oil. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thirty weight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I've not had that one yet. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, oh, what's that? Okay. Uh, describe your personality in one of the following ways. Now, the the first one here. If you don't catch it, it you have to be a Jeff. Dun I love Jeff Dunham. You have to be a big Jeff Dunham fan to understand this first thing. Okay. 
So describe your personality in either Peanut, Mariah Carey, or Kanye West. Uh, man, I I guess I'm gonna go with Kanye West. <laughs> <laughs> little, am, I, little am, am, am I gonna have to describe it as as him um no no what, I, I, what mean, I, I know what my thought is i'll tell you this this is the way i look at it well i'm not uh, a P diva that's certainly not i'm not mariah i'm i'm far I'm from a diva here. so i had to i had to scratch that mm. one out immediately Right. Peanut, he's just, if you've ever seen Jeff Dunham, Peanut is just kind of off the wall and spastic and just bounces everywhere. Kanye West, he's, you know, well, I think probably the reason needs I went Prozac or something. <laughs> yeah, I, that wasn't, there weren't a lot of great choices, to be honest, if I'm being fair. But um, <laughs> I went with Kanye uh, because I, I think he, um, I think he's a, he's an amazing creative mind i do i okay. do respect his creative creative process and his drive i mean his drive is insane um his creative his style and taste in music you know was very similar to mine when i was kind of in that um you know in that era his right. his his relationship with his mom is very special um my mom and i are very close so there's a lot of things I've heard him say on interviews that are very parallel to kind of my relationship with my mom and right. in my journey as a, as a growing into an adult, but also as a musician, how supportive she was and how, you know, she, she just was that driving force when I probably would have otherwise, you know, gone another direction. Um, so outside of him being a little crazy, I think there's a lot of similarities there, but that's, you know, I do have a line in the sand. <laughs> I, don't, right. I don't go over the over the line. <laughs> and I like that. And I like that, you know, and, and that kind of gives a different layer to that question that maybe needs <laughs> to be approached of saying, you know, and explain why you picked that person. Maybe that's what I need to do. Well, it started off with process of elimination, but then, at you know, <laughs> there are like a, when I was thinking about, it, there are a lot of parallels to, the way he approaches his creative process, his relationship with his mom and, you know, those, those things. Right. I think we and, have something in common with everybody. I think everybody's got at least some common thread that they, you know, can relate to. Yeah. It, it goes beyond the, what is that? The, um, what do they call that? The seven, seven shades. It's not seven shades of bacon, but like the, the seven degrees time. of Kevin Bacon, yeah, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, these these are getting away from the funniness of it, but they're still very. I feel like they're very good questions. Uh, I think they're great because I these are questions I don't get. So <laughs> I like I like thinking on my toes. I love it. <laughs> um, the the first one I want to ask, and this one just came to my mind, and and it's because I mean one of the things you talk about, we all have something, you know. Uh, I'm a huge Luke Combs fan. And he talks about in his song, Doing This, how that question came about. So if you weren't doing music, what would you be doing? Um, well, when I was younger, I wanted to be a pro athlete. I mean, I didn't, I, I stopped growing at five, nine, five, ten. So that kind of, that stopped me, <laughs> stopped that, put it into that dream real quick. But um, yeah, I wanted to be a pro athlete. I, you, I, that would have probably been my dream outside of music not that i would have been doing that now because you, you don't you don't just choose to be an athlete right you either can do right. it or you can't um and i certainly wouldn't be a pro athlete um talent wise but that's what i wanted to do but mm -hmm. realistically speaking um i don't know i would probably have a corporate job and you know try to be just you know getting by for i, I it's hard mm -hmm. to say i i don't really know i, I I can tell you what I would want to do. It would be the pro, pro athlete or something in the entertainment industry. If I wasn't right. a singer or a musician, um, I would probably try to find a way to be involved creatively in some other way. I mean, creativity is just, if I'm not creating something, whether it's a video or a song or just something a quote, mm -hmm. or, you know, anything that's just creative, um, I think would make me happier than, 
sitting in an office somewhere. So take oh, that yeah. back. I would not be doing any corporate America stuff because I left that on purpose. <laughs> so <laughs> I would probably be, maybe I'd be a, maybe I'd be a TikTok content creator somewhere just trying to make it off of views. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get that one viral video. Yeah. Yeah. Storm a bunch of paint against the wall, see what sticks. <laughs> Um, somebody writes a documentary, a documentary about your life, just like they, you know, they had Garth, they had the Dean Dillon, they've had all those who would, and this is like a full length movie type of documentary. This isn't just a question answer. Who would star as you? Man, that's a great question. Um, let's see who would be, who would be a good me? That is something I don't know. Ralph Macchio, Karate Kid, <laughs> making grow, making grow his hair out. I mean, he's ageless, so he still looks like he's thirty-two <laughs> years old. <laughs> I know. He's Italian like I am, so maybe I mean it would you know, maybe that yeah. would work. That's a, that's a good that's a good answer. I like that. Um, let's see. Oh, maybe Colin. Maybe Colin Farrell. He's pretty cool. I like Colin yeah. Farrell. That that would be a good one. Yeah, that would be really good. Um, if you could have dinner with one artist who has passed and you, you're having a conversation while you're sitting down to dinner with this artist, what would your conversation be centered around? And who would that artist be? Let's see. It would probably be. Um, I'd say Elvis Presley. And okay. I would I, I say that because he's still iconic. He was so iconic. He's from the South. He's a Southern boy. He came from nothing. He overcame a lot of odds to to kind of get where he got. Um, he he didn't sound like other artists of that time, you know, that were doing that type of music. Uh, there was there's just a lot of reasons I would I would choose Elvis. But he I think the main reason is just because he came from such humble Southern gospel beginnings and and very similar like to my family we didn't have a lot of money we just like music we're just a small town country family and um i would i would probably i think the thing i would be most interested in in knowing directly from him is how it felt at that little gray area where you're not just starting out but you're not this mega you know, global superstar where you're burnt out and you're just over it. That sweet spot where you 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 know you're about to become this global sensation, but you're not jaded from it yet. You're enjoying right. the fruits of your labor and such. I would just want to know uh, just a peek inside of what that was like because to be able to buy a Cadillac for someone and gift that to them. And to be mm -hmm. able to be generous and do these cool things, because it's no fun to be successful and, and wealthy if you don't have friends and family and other people to share it with. Right. Right. I wouldn't want to be I wouldn't want to be super famous and super wealthy and not have anybody in my life to enjoy those fruits. So I would love to just hear. How from an organic description, how that felt, right. you know, just to hear what it was like making that when he got over that hump, not, not when he was here, but not when he was here, but right in that sweet spot. Yeah. That would just be exactly. so cool to know. That's a, cause he lived a life unlike many others. Oh, he did. And we can agree <laughs> and that he did. And that's a really good answer. I like that. I think it's, uh, and you explained it very well about, you know, getting to that, that sweet spot in his life where he's going to go, you know, beyond where he was, he comes from humble beginnings and then he's just about to, explode to the point that he's everybody around the world knows him, loves him, goes crazy for him. Doesn't matter whether he's in, uh, you know, Jasper, Wyoming or, um, you know, soccer, Japan or any of those places, right. you know, wherever he's at, people are going nuts. Yeah. Um, I, it would just be cool to hear that, you know, that excitement. Yeah. yeah. And I, and to hear it directly from him, I mean, that would be, how cool would that be? Just a, yeah. just a one-on-one -on -one conversation off the record. Oh, 
that'd be that'd be priceless. Yeah. And, you know, and, and honestly, that's a question that I, I've never had the opportunity, but I'm and I'm not going to mention the artist, but I have an artist in mind. If I ever have the opportunity, I may ask them that question. That's that's a good one. The, the way that you put it, you know, where how did you feel in that sweet spot and where was it before it just busted wide open? Yeah. You know, and I think some people are built for that life. I think I think some people like I don't think that fame and fortune has changed Dolly Parton one iota. You know, she's the she hasn't let it bring her down. She hasn't let it, you know, if she's been depressed or any, you know, jaded, she certainly certainly hadn't shown it like she made a comment one time that she was like they said they asked her you know is fame gotten two years is it, is it too much to handle or do you ever get like it's overwhelming and she was like no this is what i wanted this is what i worked for this is you know i could be working in the mountains of tennessee back home. you know she basically was like this is great what are you talking about you know so that's uh, i think some people are just built for that lifestyle and and some people aren't and it's uh but i think everybody thinks they are and it would be nice to find out how it felt in that in that sweet spot in that moment when you, you weren't he knew he wasn't going to be a truck driver anymore and he knew right. he wasn't going to have to like scrounge for food and his family was going to be but he wasn't like this global just where he couldn't even go out in public anymore he was in that right. that fun that fun zone couldn't even walk out in his front yard i mean he go out in the front yard and there'd be people outside the gates waiting, waiting. for him. yeah that yeah. That would be a little much, I think. So yeah, I, I could. That's too much invasion of privacy for me. <laughs> um, so where can where can people that want to find out more about Ryan say they want to listen to your music or they want to find out more about you and read up on you? Because I mean, even though we've talked for you know a while, there's a lot of stuff about Ryan Trotty that we didn't even touch on because you just have such an amazing bio and story and Thank just you. so I much. That. That you know, uh, your accomplishments. I mean, we didn't touch on those because I'm telling you folks, if you go to the, if you go to the website and you, you look at, uh, I think it's under the one sheet, there's, it's almost a one sheet of just the accomplishments. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I probably, I probably yeah. could, could prune it a little bit and make it, make it, I guess, more relevant, but I've been very grateful to, to be able to get um, to, you know, to accomplish what I've accomplished. And yeah. it's, 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 you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm one of those people where I'll probably always strive to get to a, the next level of whatever I'm doing, but I won't be, I'm not the type of person that's not happy with where I'm at. You know, I, I don't, uh, I've, I've, I'm content with what I've got and I'm always hungry for more. I can, I can live in that spot just the right. same, you know, equally. So, um, and I think that's, I think that's important, you know, for, for whatever, for new musicians, uh, up and coming musicians, for whatever path your life takes you on. I think right. uh, you got to find contentment with where you are and enjoy the fruits of what you, where you are. And, but, but still dream and still have that hunger to, to, to push further. And as long as you don't let it consume you to the point where you're not happy with where you are, there's a healthy balance right. there. And I think, um, you know, I think that that's, that's where I'm at. You know, I think I, I hopefully I'll always be in that mindset at least. Absolutely. I mean, and, and that's very, you put that very well, you know, you, you're content with where you are to where you're not going to, to feel like you're, you haven't accomplished anything, right. but then you still have that hunger and that drive and that passion to go, you know, a little bit farther. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't have to have a new truck. I've got a truck. It's a great right. truck, but you know, uh, may come a point where I want one a little closer to being new. There you and, go. And, well, it is a brand new one, but you know, I'm happy with what I got now. I think, and, I think it's the balance, you know, like everything in life is a balance. It's about finding that, that yin and yang, you know, it's being happy where you are, but you know, still pushing and, and working and striving. I don't think we're, you know, I don't think we're made to just sit on the couch and be lazy and, and sit around all day. You know, I think we have to live with a purpose and, we also have to, you know, be thankful and grateful for, for what our blessings are at, at that time as well. So, right. I, I would have to disagree with you on one point, because if I would have gotten to talk to God before he made me, I would have asked him to just make me the type that could just be content sitting around all day. 
<laughs> well, I think I like that's lazy, but I can still do that on certain well, days, you know. Well, man, I think that's the goal, right? Is to retire and just sit somewhere on a right. beach somewhere with a cold drink. Um, right. You know, hopefully looking back on your life and your accomplishments and, and have a sense of, uh, you know, pride and, and, and contentment. But yeah, I mean, as long as I'm willing and, and, and able bodied and, and, and things are moving forward and, and I don't feel like I'm, either you know stagnant or moving backwards or if i feel like i'm just it's become too stressful or it's not enjoyable you know then then i'm then i'm fine with continuing to wake up every day that i'm blessed with and and push forward in in one form or fashion so absolutely hopefully hopefully that'll uh you know continue to progress and move forward but if it doesn't right. you know like i said i'm i'm content either way so um, tell tell the folks, um, you know, kind of watching and listening, where where's the best place to, to follow you? I mean, social media is a have to in today's society. Um, almost even if you're not and I mean, if you're not a artist, a celebrity or whatever, just to keep up with that stuff is you almost have to have social media. You know? Yeah, it is. It's funny when I do a show, people are like, well, are you on Facebook? Or they'll say, are you on Instagram? And I'll look at them and I, they just saw me get done pouring my heart out on stage for three hours. And they asked me if I'm on social media. I'm like, I wouldn't be very good at what I do if I wasn't <laughs> on social Like, just ask me what my social media is. Don't ask if I've got it, you know, you ask right. me what it is. But um, no, it's, it is a necessity and it's, it's overwhelming sometimes, especially in, in yeah. even for, even from two years ago the amount of content that you have to post now to, to trigger the algorithm and to get all the, the, the wheels mm -hmm. spinning in your favor. It's a full time job just to sit yeah. around and create content and curate it and post it and this and that. Um, so I'm on, I'm on pretty much everything. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Snapchat. Um, I would say the two, well, I would say in YouTube, obviously Spotify, all the streaming. I mean, there's not really any platform I'm not on and you can, the easiest way to find me is just to Google my name. There's not a lot of Ryan Trotties in the world. In fact, I think there's only one other one that I've found anywhere on the map anywhere. So if uh -huh. you Google me, you'll find everything you need, but my website is a good home base. It's just Ryan Um, that's where my one sheet and a lot of information is as far as day to day stuff. I would say my Instagram and my Facebook page are probably my two where you can keep up with on the fly, you know, post a pic, post a video, that type of thing. Um, right. I try to not be redundant too much. I try to use each platform for different purposes. So my website is kind of, again, my home base. Facebook is a little bit more for planning out my shows and for posting full length videos and, and that type of thing. Instagram is a little bit more spontaneous. I'm in the moment. I post a picture. I do, you know, this. And um, I try to keep them all entertaining for, for different purposes. Um, right. And TikTok is something I'm, I'm trying to really kind of force myself into doing more often because everybody in the industry is like, you got to have your TikTok. You got to do your TikTok. <laughs> and it really is a good, it is a great platform. I'm not, I'm not denying. It's just that uh, it's just so much to keep up with. Like, when am I oh, going to okay. find time to write and plan my shows and do all this stuff? Cause I'm still wearing a lot of hats as an independent artist. You got to do, you know, I'm doing all my artwork. I'm doing all my writing, I'm doing a lot of the, all the scheduling, I'm doing all the booking and right. the logistics, all of that. So, you know, it's just yeah. labor of love. It's, it's, it's hard work until you make it. And then it's, you know, still hard work, but at least you have, you can afford to kind of delegate some of the responsibility hey. to other people. <laughs> hey, I I'm with you there, man. You know, you, you got to delegate that stuff out because you'll run yourself into the ground. If you try to do it constantly by yourself, it's I don't tough, even yeah. know near what, uh, you know, most the artists that I interview, I try to stay active as much as possible, but I mean, and, and it's no, I guess, cop out, but with a full time job and, you know, a family and come home and take care of the dogs and mow the right. yard. And, and everybody has to do that stuff, you know, for the most part. Um, I, I feel like I don't have time, but it's just setting, you know, I'm, I'm not very good at, I guess, delegating to myself where I'm saying, OK, I need to set 10 minutes aside to post this you know, so that I wish I was, I wish I was organized like that. I'm, 
yeah. there, I'm, I'm the most abstract per, I'm not linear in any way. Like I wish I could wake up and say, okay, from nine to 10, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to set aside three hours for writing. And you know, that, that structure right. for me, I wake up, I get my cup of coffee and then just go where the day takes me. And I try to knock out as much of my to-do list as possible. And, uh, uh, that's some that's a that's a place where I really need to <laughs> to try to get a little better at. But yeah. I just think that's I think that creative people, you know, we some people are left brain, some people are right brain. And I just don't think that's a strength of mine is to be very like rigid in terms of, you know, my structure. But right. I feel like sometimes I'm just no brain. So it's just like I just <laughs> whatever happens the majority happens, of the time. Right. I'm not going to try to plan it because it's not going to do any good anyway. Something, you know, I, I've got this very, I guess you would call it jaded philosophy on life. It's, uh, not every day, but some days it's like there's no sense in trying to do it because it, I'm, I'm not going to do it right. The algorithms aren't <laughs> going to pick it up. You know, I, I, I negative, I just put too much negativity and stuff and I just need to go, just do it and don't worry about it. Whatever happens, happens. I saw you know. something the other day. I'm I'm always trying to get a leg up on like what the current trend is, what the current what's what's working for other people and you know try to stay as much in the loop mm-hmm. as I possibly can. And <clears throat> and specifically talking about um you know TikTok and following up on some of the you know what the professionals are saying is they're saying you know don't think about it just post get it out there and, you know, don't overthink it. I'm a perfectionist a lot of times when it comes to editing and making sure Mm -hmm. it sounds really good and my voice was on point or, you know, my hair was, you know, not looking like I just woke up or, you know, all these things I think about because it's like once it's out there, it's out there. I don't want to give new people the wrong impression. Right. But then you kind of like you get paralysis by analysis and it's like, well, now I've only ended up posting one video all week or whatever versus every day or every other day. So lately I've just been almost in a, almost in a rebellious way. I've just been posting whatever's in my camera roll. Like I just, if it's right. a video clip from a show and it sounds like crap, I just throw it out there and I put maybe one word caption. Cause I'm like, if I sit around all day and try to like think of the perfect thing to say and the perfect hashtags and all that, I'm just going to get burnt out and not do it. Whereas if I just post and say, man, this crowd was crazy. Boom. Then, you know, then yeah. I'm feeding the algorithm and, and yeah, they say it's quantity over quality. Hey, if you say so, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try it out. You're the pros. <laughs> yep, exactly. So I will say, going back to something you said earlier, I learned, I learned very quickly that if I was going to do this as a serious career, as a full-time serious mm-hmm. effort to try to make it in the music industry, which is hard enough when everything's going perfectly, Um, let alone when you've got all these other things holding you back. I knew that I was going to have to leave my corporate job. I I did work a a corporate job with Wells Fargo advisors for like 12 years. And it was, it it paid well, great benefits, all the perks, but also it had all the the normal headaches of a corporate, corporate desk job. And uh, the day I left was (laughs) the first day, uh, the first day of our, it was our first show with my new band at that time. Wow. So it, it was like, it was almost serendipitous. I was just like, I got to go. This is it. And it worked out and I never looked back. So I've been able to do music full time since I left. And uh, like Steve Harvey said, sometimes you just got to, you just got to jump. You just got to, yep. you just got to leap. So now how long ago has that been? Because you've been in Nashville for how long now? Well, I, I, I still have a, I still live in uh, Charlotte. Technically I still have a okay. condo here. So we're on the road so much. It's kind of hard to say. I, I almost, I'm almost like a, just a visitor here, really. I mean, I'm only here a few days a week if that, but, uh, but that's a good problem to have. I try to be in Nashville at least once or twice a month. Um, I'm thinking about moving there full time very soon. I've got a lot of friends that live there now. Um, mm-hmm. my, my condo here in Charlotte is, is in a really, thankfully it's in a good location where the, the market here is just crazy in terms of renting and being able to, you know, oh, find yeah. a, a tenant. So I think it's a good time as far as all the logistics are concerned that I can make it happen. So that's something that's in motion now to be more full time there. But I'd say I probably split the time evenly with, with Nashville and Charlotte outside of just doing shows and be on the road. We'll be in Nebraska next week. We'll be in Denver, Colorado for the week after that. So um, 
we're making we're we're putting a lot of miles on on my car. <laughs> right, right. I saw I saw a lot of the shows. Which, as Ryan said earlier, if you want to find out where he's playing, uh, the best place to do that's his Facebook because he had a, a listing of all of his shows and mm-hmm. and stuff coming up on the Facebook page. As I was looking at that earlier, yeah, and, that saves uh, up the day. And that's that's the probably the best platform to keep that kind of thing on as a matter of fact i was reading that today um mm-hmm. i i do a lot of reading about you know uh, i i take a lot of what they tell artists and how they direct artists to do stuff and i try to put that in play with the podcast and mm-hmm. as you can tell if you go back and you look at the social media i don't do it very well <laughs> <laughs> My wife is the social media maven. I mean, she's on social media all the time. She's got her business she runs. And I go to her and I pick her brain and just long enough for her to waste her breath and tell me what to do. And then I never get around to doing it. So <laughs> it, if I would listen more, it would probably help. Or if I would apply it more. They, Not that they, I got a, they, they have a name. They have a name for, for people like that, for people like you. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> they they call them they call them ask holes. Ask holes. <laughs> <laughs> they just ask a bunch of questions and they never apply any of it. It just they just ask and then it just goes in a hole somewhere. <laughs> That's exactly right. And if and I my wife is probably watching this. I don't know. And she is <laughs> as soon as I walk up, she'll go, Hey ask hole, what are you doing? <laughs> Listen, don't give me any hate mail. Like, don't email me and say, look, I can't believe it now. I got this terrible nickname. Yeah, my wife calls me an asshole all the time now. Yeah, that next <laughs> podcast, you'll, you'll have it on your shirt. She'll have, have gotten you one for your birthday or something. She makes, <laughs> she makes she'll make me one. She, yeah. She'll just go over to her shop area and it, she'll have one printed up by the end please, of the week. If she does, send me that. I need a picture of that. I'm going to have to see that. I'm going to see me on me down. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Listen, uh, I, have funny, I have something funny. I have funny to tell you here. I this you, you said what is something people don't know about Ryan Trot? It's probably it was obviously a lot, but the right. one funny it's it's so it's embarrassing, but it's funny. It's a, it's funny enough that I tell it willingly, but it's uh-huh. it, it's one of those things that's just gonna haunt me and follow me my entire life. So <laughs> Like I said, I'm from a small country town and in maybe everywhere, I don't know, but in South Carolina, every town has a, some annual festival. You know, right. the Peanut Festival, Watermelon Festival, you've got the, our, my town is the Frog Jump. It's our spring festival. I mean, everybody's got their festival. And so um, years ago, when I was like five years old, I was a kid, I was a little kid, I was five years old. Um, Every festival, every year when they had the festival, well, the, the week leading up to it, they had they had like a beauty pageant, like a local beauty pageant for all the girls. And they had like these different crafts and just different fun little things leading up to the festival. And that that beauty pageant was always something that was it led to like a, a regional thing. And then you could actually get in the, the girls, you know, some would get into the Miss South Carolina. You know, it was kind of a qualifying progressive thing. and. Um, one year they got the bright idea to open it up to, to like a little boys division, you know, like little, little, little fellas. And <laughs> it was like from like five to 10 years old. It was like this five year, you know? And mm-hmm. so every mother in, in the County surrounding, like enrolled their, their kid, their, their, their son in this, this thing, this beauty pageant. Right. Cause that's what you did in small towns. You just, you took, you took part in these things. Right. Listen, I, I had to do what I was told. I was five years old. I wanted a bowl of cereal or some ice cream, I'm sure. So I needed to follow my mom's orders. And she said, you're going to be in. And I said, OK. And so anyway, she put me in this beauty pageant for boys or whatever, the boys division. Uh-huh. And I ended up winning. it. Oh, my God. Five, five years old, like 30, 30 <laughs> of the local kids. And I ended up winning this thing. And uh, the trophy was taller than me. I was like this little kid. And I had like, she had me in like a full tuxedo. And I'm, I had this, I had all this hair. She had like hair sprayed up, look like John Travolta. I, she used like two cans of Aquanet on me. Oh Def, definitely, definitely had a part in, you know, depleting the ozone layer back in the day. But she, um, 
<laughs> Needless to say, she put me in. I win it, and then they ne- they never had it again. They they did away with it the next year. So I was like the reigning champion for year and year and year, and they've never had it since. So it's the <laughs> one and done only. And I'm like in our town hall of fame or whatever. <laughs> and they talk about it all the time. And the funniest thing, it, my ex girl a long time ago, my ex girlfriend called into 1037 here in Charlotte, the country station. <laughs> Because they, yep. were, they were talking about these little town festivals, and they said, you know, do you have any stories about it? And she called and told them that, and they just they, – they made it a big feature and just got a huge kick out of it. But the oh, funniest part about that whole story, because that's so far from, like, who, who I am as a man, that the funniest part is my title, is the title that I, I had. You know, so our town <laughs> festival is the Frog Jump, and, you know, you got the Junior Miss Frog Jump and whatever. My right. title was – Master Tadpole. <laughs> master Tadpole. So now when I go home and see all my friends and everybody, hey, there's the Master Tadpole, you know, the reigning champ. I'm like, guys, come on. So embarrassing, but it's so funny because all the, you know, all the older ladies in town, they, they remember me as this kid and it's just, right. It's cute because they love it, but it's just so embarrassing. It's like, if that, it's like, that's the type of thing that TMZ digs up. You know, if you ever make it or whatever, right. they'll find that picture. And I'm standing there with my trophy and they're like, <laughs> Master Tadpole. <laughs> uh, that's what I started to say. I wondered if your mom still had that picture around. And, Listen, uh, she's it, got, she's probably got everything I did as a kid somewhere in a, in a box. I'm sure she keeps everything. Wow. <laughs> Now you talk about a t-shirt. That would be a t-shirt I'd like to see. <laughs> Master Tadpole. Don't be surprised if somebody walks up to you and says, here, here's a gift from George. <laughs> Listen, if that happens, I'll wear it on stage. I promise you. That would be that I'd wear it. I'd wear it just, just for the joke of it. Just, just for the hey, I, I have it in with some people in your camp. I'll just tell you that. I'm not even gonna tell you who it is. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those, like I said, it's one of those things. I just, I like to get it out, just get it out early. That way they can't use it against me, you know, cause they'll feel like if they find out, I'm like, man, I just got to own it. I just got to own it. <laughs> yeah. I, I dug in pretty deep, but I never did see that. I wish I, I had him. I don't, I don't that. share that. Yeah. That's not something I post. <laughs> I, I, I control now, I'm, I'm a gatekeeper on that one. I, I control when that gets out. <laughs> <laughs> that's great man that is great well ryan man it's been a blast hanging out Same with you here, talking. Man. my jaws hurt from laughing so much it's just been great <laughs> well and, listen uh, i appreciate you guys having me man i had a blast i this i love doing stuff like this this is so much fun for me yeah, I've had a blast sitting here chatting with you. And uh, if if you're, you know, if you're out and you're looking for uh, for Ryan, just go to ryantrotty.com. He's got all of his links to his social media. He makes it so easy. You just click the link and it'll take you to it. Check him out on the Spotify. All the DSP links are there. And give him a listen. And uh, uh, the other thing I like to encourage people, because if if there's not a show close to your area, but you find out, hey, you know, I really like this guy. And I like his music and I, I you know, want to really show my, my enjoyment of what he does, then buy his merch, man. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that's one of the big things. That's how you can help these artists out, especially the independents. Uh, you know, that's a big Absolutely. thing. So, yeah, uh, so just, I'm with- always updating my merch, uh, my store on my website as well. It's mm-hmm. constantly um, adding new, new merch and new designs and things like that. And, um, I'm really active too. I mean, I mean, I'm really active in, in, in talking to my, you know, fans and people who support me and that message me and, and reach out to me on, on social media. So, you know, definitely reach out to me, send me a message, ask me questions. I'm, I'm happy to talk and, and create that relationship. Absolutely. So we'll be, we'll be watching you and then seeing how things are going. And again, don't be surprised if a package shows up, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and if you do, if it does, and you do wear that on stage, I've got to have a picture. Have You'll have a have picture. <laughs> I may have. To, I may repay. I may have to repay that with a, a your own t shirt, though. You know, but <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll come up with a you know like a, a t-shirt buddies or something. I don't know. We'll some weird thing. You know, kind of like be, that'd be our ongoing. That'd be our that'd be our 
ongoing Christmas joke. You know, you get your Christmas right. card and your presents. <laughs> what is it now? <laughs> right. What is it this time? Well, man, you take care. And uh, I look forward to keeping up with you and seeing how things are going. Yes, sir, man. Let's do it again soon. We sure will. Thanks a lot. Ryan Trotty, folks. You guys take care. Have a great night. We'll see you back here on Thursday. Thank you. See y'all later.